experts reckon that something like 40 million have been produced. And they were distributed liberally. Anybody that showed any sympathy to the communist creed was immediately given a carload of Kalashnikovs and plenty of ammunition to go with it. So that was, the, that was its contribution. It simply swamped everything else. The United States first came up against the AK-47 in the early 1960s in Vietnam. Just as the Americans began to get involved in Southeast Asia, the U.S. Army introduced its own first true assault rifle, a featherweight rifle called the M16. Designed by Eugene Stoner in the late 1950s and built by the Colt Firearms Company, the rifle took full advantage of the most modern alloys and plastics. But while the black rifle won the praise of engineers and designers, it had a difficult time winning the hearts of the infantrymen. Soldiers criticized the M16 as being too weak. They didn't like its puny 5.56 millimeter cartridge, a bullet that looked too small to do any damage. Army researchers worked hard to convince the soldiers of its hidden virtue. The fact is, a small bullet traveling very fast can do as much damage as a slow-moving heavy bullet. The smaller slugs tumble when they penetrate soft tissue and inflict larger wounds. To make matters worse, the first M16s arrived in Vietnam without proper training manuals and cleaning kits. The rifle earned a bad reputation as a gun that easily jammed. Many soldiers failed to realize how important it was to keep the gun clean until it was too late. Designers made modifications to the M16 to prevent it from jamming so easily. The soldiers were also encouraged to clean the weapon as often as possible. Ever so slowly, the M16 began to win the respect of the infantrymen. Today, a new generation of soldiers stake their lives on the performance of the M16. Like its chief competitor, the AK-47, the M16 remains in frontline service. For nearly 30 years, gunsmiths have been unable to develop a gun that is substantially better than these battle-proven assault rifles. We've reached a plateau, if you like, in the development of small arms. And to go any further, it's going to cost a hell of a lot of money and a hell of a lot of research because we don't know which direction to go. There is no way you can conventionally improve the present day weapons because they are at the peak of their perfection. One could argue a case for tomorrow's guns. Designers are testing new guns equipped with laser sights and thermal scopes. They can find their targets with ease and strike them more often. But when it comes to firepower, today's experimental prototypes are not really any more potent than the guns they are aimed to replace. Since the first long arms appeared nearly six centuries ago, Inventors have never given up their search for a better gun. Perfection has been hailed at many points along the way, but some new technology has always emerged and rendered that ultimate gun obsolete. Each step forward has brought new capabilities and new consequences. Advancements, it seems, cannot be ignored for history painfully demonstrates that tradition can be costly when those in charge are reluctant to embrace new ideas. Throughout their long and complicated history, guns have brought both peace and suffering. In many ways, guns have defined who we are and the world that surrounds us. Like their history, the future of guns will reflect the future 